hello, everyone. My name is Darren. I am one of the marketing coordinators with BCIT's School of Health Sciences. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to the information session for the medical radiography program. I just want to say how happy we are to see you all and thank you for attending our presentation today. I want you to feel free to post any questions or comments you have into the chat during the presentation, and we will address as many questions as we can near the end of the presentation in the Q&A section. And if you could all please keep your microphones and videos turned off just until the end of the presentation to reduce any connectivity issues or interruptions, that would be much appreciated. And I'd like to mention that the British Columbia Institute of Technology acknowledges that our campuses are located on the unceded traditional territories of the Coast Salish nations of Squamish, tsleil and Musqueam. And our agenda for today is a welcome and introductions. We'll do some quick poll questions to find out where everyone's at. We'll do a presentation and program overviews. We'll have some information from program advising. And at the end, we'll do uh, questions and answers for our remaining time. And to get us started here, it's my honor to introduce uh, Denise Pelzer, the program head for mm -hmm. medical radiography. Thanks, Darren. So just um, back to the poll question for the program specific. Um, so you're right, most of you guys were right that a doctor wouldn't just order an x-ray just to look at um, a broken bone. So really depending on the parameters of your setting or the equipment we're using, we can also look at soft tissue and um, organs. So we'll see a little bit more of that as I go through the presentation. Okay, it looks like our uh, video. If you give me just one moment, I'll uh, switch my share screen. What I love about medical radiation is the variety. It is different every day, and that's what makes it so exciting. And we'll go from there, okay? All right. As a medical radiation technologist, we use general x-ray machines. We use a fluoroscopy unit, CT, and mammography. The most rewarding thing about this job is when patients tell you how much they appreciate what you've done. That's why I love my job. Okay, so you, if we're going to do it, um, in the medical radiography program at BCIT is a two-year diploma program. You do a term of academics where we teach you the theory of the positioning and the anatomy. We teach you the physics and the equipment. And then the next term you go out to clinical and practice everything that we've taught you. The students practice on equipment at BCIT that they will be able to find at most clinical sites. And the integration of VR is completely unique to BCIT. It helps the students learn the orientation of the anatomy um, and how it relates to the type of positions that we try and put our patients into. Once our students graduate from our program, they are fully prepared to write the National Certification Exam, the CAMRT, which allows them to work across Canada. The reason I love this profession is because of the changing technology and the time that I am able to spend with patients, one-on-one, -on -one, communicating with them and getting to know them. This is a really rewarding profession. <laughs> So as Darren switching the um, back to the PowerPoint, um, so Jello was one of our, our graduating students a few years back, um, and so we're going to talk a few things about. We're going to talk a little bit about some of the things that she did mention in um, that she, you actually saw in the video and that she did mention. Um, but we're going to start. We're going to talk about what an X-ray uh, technologist actually is. So um, we're called a medical radiographic technologist or an MRT. Um, we use highly technical equipment to produce ionizing radiation to create images of bones and organ systems, so soft tissues, uh, for the radiologist to interpret those images um, and then produce a diagnosis for um, uh, the patients. Um, and sometimes it will include treatment plans as well if they're needed. Um, so over the last 10 to 15 years, 
the technology has improved so drastically that the procedures are faster um, and uh, decreasing the exam times and actually um, improving the safety of the, the procedures that we do. So we produce really high quality images with a minimal amount of radiation. Um, a technologist must not only have technical skills, but they also must have soft skills or human skills, um, which include empathy and some communication skills as well. So um, we work really closely with our patients and actually with other um, members of the healthcare team. So we need to be able to communicate quite, um, quite well. And so when we're with our patients, we're actually um, making sure that they are feeling comfortable and that they are safe. So um, we need to be empathetic to the situation that they're in as well. Um, and that, um, that we understand you know, the experience that they're having. Um, we also need, again, to communicate with them as to what is expected during the exam and that they need to be aware that we are there to help them throughout. Um, we also need to be able to respond to any questions they might have about exams and about radiation as well. And so that's a, um, a lot of the information that you will get from this program um, so that we, you ensure the safety of your patients. Um, our program has a variety of educational delivery method, methods, and so we'll introduce you to technical skills and we'll help you develop those, those human skills. Um, for the most part, we're constantly um, adjusting our equipment and uh, supporting our patients. So we're usually going in and out of the rooms, um, but be either behind a control panel or beside the patient if, if that's where we're needed to be. And, um, and that's how we work through our procedures. Um, next slide, please. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about what Jella had spoken, the different areas of radiography. So the most common is general radiography. Um, so usually the general radiography produces like a two-dimensional image of either bones or the bony systems or the, um, the body systems. Uh, the images are static and they re represent a moment in time. Um, currently, all of the images are electronic. So when I started, it was on film. Um, we used to have to deal with chemicals like fixer and developer to, um, to process our images. But now we actually have two systems. One is called computed radiography or CR for short. Um, and that actually involves an imaging plate that we would actually expose, um, like say, take a hand x-ray, we would expose it on that plate. And we actually have to take it to a reader to run the plate through so that it will produce an image on the computer screen. Um, we also have digital radiography, which is an immediate exposure. So we don't actually have to handle the, the plate at all. Um, it's a digital detector actually. And so as soon as we expose within Three, three seconds, the image is right up on the computer screen. Um, so uh, both utilize um, the data collected on the imaging plate or the detector, and then they create the electronic image for us to review. Uh, computed tomography, so Jella also mentioned that, and that still uses ionizing radiation, but instead of producing a, a two-dimensional image, it produces an image that actually shows organs in relationship and to one another. It's like taking um, a slice through the body and then standing at the foot end and looking inside. Um, and so what happens here is that the uh, little x-ray tube and the, the detectors are in um, a, something that looks like a really big donut and the patient actually moves through the donut as um, the exposures are going on and it takes like a spiraling image of the patient as they go through. And then it produces all these slices and the radiologist will then look at those slices. Um, the interesting thing about CT is that um, the computer can also uh, do something called reformatting and it will take all of this data that it's collected from these slices and actually create a three-dimensional organ or system and it will allow the radiologist or the doctor looking at it to, to turn it around and actually look at it from all sides. And I'm going to show you an image of that shortly. Uh, fluoroscopy. So fluoroscopy is actually um, dynamic um, imaging. And so instead of taking a static image, it actually will look, take an exposure over a length of time and you can actually see motion. So it's like doing um, a video of something. Um, and so what we use this for is um, looking at function of organs or systems. Uh, most commonly, uh, we could give a patient something uh, to drink, and it's called barium. It doesn't look very nice. It's kind of pasty. Uh, it doesn't taste very good either. 
Um, and we can ask the patient to swallow. So we can actually watch them swallow. Um, the other thing that we can do under fluoroscopy is if a radiologist has to um, put an x-ray dye inside of a joint or say withdraw some fluid from a joint for testing, um, they can actually use fluoroscopy to advance the needle into the right place, the right spot, and uh, either inject x-ray dye or withdraw fluid from it. So we can use it there as well. Uh, interventional procedures. So when it comes to interventional radiography, it's sort of a combination of both um, CT and fluoroscopy. And uh, these, this, these procedures are, are used more for um, patients that we know have an illness, whether um, say if, if a cardiac patient has a blockage of some sort or a narrowing blood vessel, um, they can actually go in Use it through um, interventional procedures and actually place a stent into the blood vessel itself to keep the blood vessel open. Or if you've ever heard of somebody having blood clots, they can actually put a filter in uh, one of the main veins of the body, the uh, vena cava, and actually it will keep cl collect all of those clots so that they don't actually go through into the lungs or into the brain um, and cause um, issues there, whether it's an embolus or a stroke. Um, Mobile imaging, so basically it's it's the general radiography, it's the fluoroscopy, um, and it's the same ideas, but it's actually the equipment is mobile. So we can actually go to the OR to assist surgeons. Um, we do a lot of work with the, um, the orthopedic surgeons, whether they are uh, repairing a bone, uh, realigning a bone, um, putting in other structure or other um, fixators, for um, whatever reason. Um, yeah, so we can go to the OR, we can go to the trauma room. So when you hear of somebody having an accident or having a cardiac arrest and being brought into the trauma room, I'm sure many of you watch um, Grey's Anatomy or any of those other shows. Um, so they can call us to those areas to do like a chest X-ray or if somebody has fallen, we can do a quick analysis um, to see what type of, of injuries they do have right there in the trauma room. The other place we go is the morgue. So if um, a body has been brought in and they're uncertain of the cause of death, we can take our mobile equipment to go to the morgue and actually do imaging there just in case there's something that um, we can discover from our imaging. And the last one on my list is mammography. So mammography, again, uses specialized, um, specialized equipment uh, to compress breast tissue and uses a specific range of the x-ray beam to um, produce fine detail uh, images for, for the breast tissue. So this is my three-dimensional rendering of a set of facial bones. So this person has received, I'm going to say, some sort of a uh, direct impact to the jaw or the mandible. Um, and if you look at the lower left side of the screen, you can see that there's a, a very uh, large break in the corner of the jaw uh, and it's separated a little bit and shifted a little bit. And usually in these type of structures that are closed and fixed, um, once there's a break one place in one area, there will be a break in another one. And it looks like there's a, a little bit of a fracture in between the two bottom teeth right at the, the chin. So these are the type of things that we would be teaching you in the program that you get to look at. Um, so yeah, so a little bit about the program. It is hands-on learning for sure. Uh, the program, we call it an integrated program. So uh, basically the program starts in, in January uh, and then runs for six consecutive terms. Uh, the first year you will alternate between uh, academic and clinical. So the first term uh, in January is academics. We teach you a whole lot of theory. Um, and then we will send you out to the clinical environment for the summer. And then you come back to BCIT in the fall for another uh, term of theory. And then the second term is um, all clinical, but there are still online courses that you will be taking. So during the academic terms, we combine theory and simulation in our positioning and patient care labs. Students use the simulation to practice positioning on one another. And then we actually use mannequins and phantoms to do exposures with, because of course we can't expose one another. Um, and then this way the students actually get to produce images and they can review the images based on how they position the mannequins. 
Um, so students practice using the equipment in positioning and imaging uh, science labs to get better understanding of the physics behind the x-ray production and how the equipment itself works. We also use a lot of um, immersive VR in our courses to support the learning. Um, our program uses a one-of-a-kind virtual uh, virtual ready, uh, sorry, virtual reality experience for students called Be the Beam. Um, we'll, um, the students will use headsets and controllers to move the x-ray equipment in the room, um, but it also will allow you to see the exposure and actually put your head inside the x-ray tube so you can actually see how the x-ray beam itself is, um, uh, is produced, which is um, kind of cool. Uh, the other VR that we use is um, there's software programs called uh, Complete Anatomy, uh, Skeletics, and Shaderware. So Skeletics and Shaderware are actually, again, x-ray rooms, but you would actually position an avatar um, and actually do exposures, which are, are very realistic. Uh, the Shaderware, actually, the um, images are produced from cadavers, so very realistic. Um, and then you can actually submit those images to an instructor for an assessment. So we tend to use a lot of um, VR in our program. So in the anatomy and image analysis labs, we have physical bones that are available for students to handle. So as you're talking about, say, the upper arm bone, which is called the humerus, you'll actually be able to work through your course work and content with an instructor, but you'll actually have the bone in your hand. So you can actually, when we talk about um, the, the bones on the bone called like the greater or lesser tuberosities, um, you can actually see where they are. Uh, and we actually would then take that and compare it to an image on the screen. So you can actually see what it actually looks like on the, uh, on the x-ray image itself. Um, during the second year, the students are out in clinical the whole, for the whole year for all three terms. Uh, the first two, or sorry, the first term and then the last term will be in the general radiography department. And then the summer term will be in the, C de the CT department. And while you're um, in these clinical areas, again, you will be doing online courses, which will be quite applicable to the areas that you're in at the time. While you're out in clinical, uh, you will be working with um, x-ray technologists that are actually all certified. So um, our clinical sites are all within the hospitals. And so all those um, technologists are certified through our professional body, the CAMRT. Um, and so you will be closely supervised while you're you know, working with patients and taking exposures. A little bit more about the clinical practicums. Uh, so, I mean, as you probably realize, a good portion of the program is out in the clinical area. Uh, the clinical sites have clinical instructors. And so the, these um, instructors are hospital employees. So they're really well versed in the, the actual equipment at the sites and the protocols that are set by the radiologists at those sites. They work in conjunction with um, a clinical coordinator from BCIT, uh, and that will help um, keep the students on track for their clinical requirements for the term. Um, the, their duties usually include this year's scheduling, so students' schedules, uh, working with them one-on-one -on, -one on cases, uh, looking at the images that they're producing, uh, evaluation, and doing evaluations and assessments. Uh, and then our clinical coordinators will go out during the term, will come out during the term to visit with the clinical instructors and the students to see how the students are doing, um, to make sure everybody is on track to complete. So as the students gain experience in the clinical settings, they move from direct supervision to indirect supervision. So when you first start in the clinical environment, you'll find that either the technologist or the CI will work closely with you, watching every move that you make pretty much to ensure that um, you're keeping yourself safe and keeping your patients safe. And then as you demonstrate um, that um, you're competent in what you're doing and that you you're then considered comp competent, um, then they will tend to step further and further back. They're always within the room or close to the room um, and to make sure that um, you don't need any help or any support, but it allows you to build your own confidence as well. Um, throughout the clinical time, students will be expected to experience all shifts that a certified technologist is expected to work in the hospital environment. So you'll have to expect that um, as you go through your clinical terms, you'll be doing afternoons and weekends. 
Um, and then we save the midnights for the last two clinical terms, but you do have to experience midnights as well. Um, we are a 24 seven profession. And so we need to uh, ensure that you're comfortable working those as well. So each clinical term includes protected academic time for students to complete online courses. Um, it averages half a day per course. Um, and as, so as I mentioned before, as you're out in clinical, you will be expected to do online courses. Um, the courses are all through BCIT with BCIT instructors, um, but we do provide you with that academic time so that you do um, have time to work on um, courses. Uh, the program has 16 to 18 clinical sites and they're spread out uh, through the lower mainland and in the, in the interior as well. So six sites in the interior, the reason the remainder of the sites are in the lower mainland. Um, each student should be expected to experience two to possibly three of those um, clinical sites. Um, and that tends to depend on um, the CT rotation as well. When we put you to the, or out to the clinical sites, what we usually do is have you do a larger trauma center and a smaller um, rural center as well, so that um, you can be comfortable in both settings. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much the, the clinical practicum. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned before, we are a 24-7 uh, profession. Um, most of the other diagnostics are not. Um, so this is kind of nice, like some people don't really understand, how do you say this? Um, I know that when I first started, I was just like, oh, I want to work Monday to Friday, but it was kind of nice having, you know, days off during the week so that you could actually do things, um, that, like um, offices that are closed on the weekends. It was nice to be able to actually make appointments like that. So it was kind of nice to have the flexibility to my schedule. Um, uh, as I mentioned before, we do both diagnostic and interventional procedures, um, so we're kind of there for both worlds. Um, the interventional area itself has expanded so much, um, and it's kind of nice because where in the past uh, patients may have had to have like an open surgery in order to, to place a tube or to remove whatever it is that they're trying to remove, um, now this can be done under the in, a, in an, an interventional suite under local anesthetic, and so the patients have a much shorter recovery time. Um, direct patient care, so we work very closely with our patients, and sometimes the the uh, contact with them may only be for five or ten minutes, and then sometimes the procedures themselves are a little bit longer. So um, you know, again, we we do work with them over an average time, you know. For maybe maybe 15 minutes, but then again, the intervention, interventional procedures are long. We uh, can work in both hospitals and in private clinics. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, we do have the mobile radiography. So literally we can go wherever our patients are. Um, so any of the patient wards, uh, again, the, the trauma room, um, when I was a student, and of course this was a very, very long time ago, um, but when the aquarium used to have orcas, um, there was an orca that had a problem with a tooth or its jaw, and so um, my clinical instructor and a group of technologists went to the uh, aquarium with the mobile machine. Of course, they had to, you know, rent a truck to load it into, but they were able to take the mobile uh, x-ray machine to the aquarium to x-ray the orca's jaw, so it was kind of cool. So where do our graduates go? <laughs> Um, you know, there's many of them that stay in the x-ray department because they just love it so much. It's, um, you know, the, the job itself is never stagnant. Patients are always changing. Procedures are changing. Um, so some of them just stay. Um, others move on um, to become shift supervisors or um, even site supervisors or managers. And in that case, um, it wouldn't just be managing people on the afternoon shift or the day shift. They would then move to managing an entire department. Um, some, uh, you know, from, from that position though, you could also consider um, being a, a manager in the sense of managing more than just the x-ray department, doing all of the diagnostics. So that would kind of be the next step up from there. And then from moving on even higher than that would be imaging directors. And so they would not just manage uh, imaging departments, but multiple sites, so multiple hospitals. So um, that's, you know, the, the path you choose to take or leadership. 
Um, some of our graduates have gone on to do the clinical informatics and the PACS administration. So because all of our images are now stored in computers and, and on servers, um, they, we do have administrators that um, come from being an x-ray tech. And it's kind of good because then you have a, a really good understanding of what you're actually seeing in the system. Um, my path was to become a clinical instructor. So I was actually a clinical instructor at a local hospital. Um, I then came to BCIT and I was the clinical coordinator. Um, and then now I'm the program head. And, and some of the technologists come and they work as instructors um, and, and just leave the, <laughs> leave the clinical environment. Many of our instructors actually still do both. We both work at BCIT as instructors and still work out in the clinical area. Um, and then some of our uh, graduates go on and work with our, the manufacturers and become product specialists. So um, there's that direction as well. Thank you so much, Denise. The next slide is actually yes. going to be uh, some, Thanks. we're going to start some admissions information. And we are very fortunate today to have uh, Maggie from Program Advising joining us. And it is my pleasure to stop Maggie from uh, handling the chat, which she's been answering very many questions. And if she wants to uh, do her presentation part, that would be yeah. wonderful. Are you ready, Maggie? Yeah, I'm ready to go. Yeah, thank you, Darren. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Just say when you want me to change the slide and I'll drive. Okay, will do. So Thanks. hi, everyone. As Darren mentioned, so my name is Maggie Ostrowski, and I'm a full-time studies program advisor here at BCIT. So I'm going to be reviewing with you briefly the entrance requirements for the program, the admissions process, along with briefly discussing some of the key student services that are available to you at BCIT. And next slide, please. So this diploma does have one intake each year in every, every January of each year. It is a full-time studies, two-year duration diploma program. So currently applications are being accepted online for the January 2024 intake through to June 30th of this year, 2023. Um, some of the qualities to be successful in this program and in this profession as well would be strong communication skills, ability to work independently and as part of a team, having excellent physical and mental health and good time and stress management skills, strong decision-making and problem-solving skills, as well as computer literacy, 3D visualization, manual dexterity, good hand-eye coordination skills as well is very helpful. So let's go through the application steps. So filling out the online application is quite straightforward. Um, once the application opens up for each cycle of the program, you can log on and review the online application. The nice thing is you can work out, um, you can work rather on filling out the application at your own pace. So the application will not go to admissions until you pay the application fee and submit it. The date that you actually apply does not have an impact on your application. You do have until the application deadline date to submit your application. So regarding the application process, ensure that you um, firstly review all the entrance requirements and the application processing dates. And then if you need to, you can upgrade or take assessment testing, to, testing rather, to meet the entrance requirements. And we do at BCIT offer upgrading courses in many of the subjects, but you can take these upgrading courses at other recognized post-secondary institutions, at adult education centers, or even online um, as well. And we in program advising, if you contact us, we can assist you with um, different options for upgrading. And do ensure that when you apply online that you have all of your required documents, such as transcripts, uh, ready to scan and upload as PDF files. Um, www.bcit.ca forward slash admission will guide you through the step-by-step -step application process. And once you're ready to apply online, you can visit www.bcit.ca forward slash apply, and that will get you going with the online application. And speaking of the application, the fee for domestic applicants is $90 Canadian. And the application process does take place entirely online. So you will therefore need to convert your official transcripts and any additional documents that may be required to PDF files. So now let's review the requirements. So the first requirement is going to be English 12 or equivalent with 73% or greater plus two years of education in English in an English speaking country, where the latter is referring to the listening and, and speaking component of English. 
Uh, you'll also require pre-calculus 12 or equivalent with 73% or greater. Also anatomy and physiology 12 or equivalent with 73% or greater. And physics 12 or equivalent with 73% or greater. You'll also need to complete the CASPER test. Um, this is an online test which utilizes everyday scenarios. Um, for example, a moral dilemma is presented to the test taker. So there's no real right or wrong way to answer these questions that are presented on CASPER. Um, we do recommend that you register for the CASPER test early because seats do fill up quickly um, for other programs for these tests. And there typically are no additional test dates available once these ones fill up. So again, you can't really study for this test as it's not a knowledge-based test. However, you can, once register with CASPER, you can go online and there's past um, exam banks available that are free that you can view. So you, at least you can in advance have some idea of the types of questions that will be answered on or asked rather on this test. So yeah, there's a lot of information on the CASPER site that will help you prepare for the exam. So do definitely spend time reviewing this information. Make sure you register with CASPER so you can get access to those free test uh, banks of questions. There's also the mandatory applicant questionnaire that's required. Um, this is your opportunity to highlight any non-academic um, experiences that you may have that, that will strengthen your application. As well, you're able to highlight your, your various skills and abilities on this form. And do note, we do get a lot of questions about the volunteer requirement for applicants. So the volunteer requirement will be for applicants who have been conditionally accepted to the program. And once you're offered a conditional seat, you will be required to show a minimum of 30 hours of volunteer work um, in a patient-related environment. So for example, such as working with patients who have mobility issues, patients who may be hard of hearing, or have other physical or mental health challenges. And this volunteer experience must be current within one year from the start of the application cycle. Um, so now with the transcripts and documents, as mentioned, as part of the online application process, you do need to upload documents in order for a timely assessment to be completed. You can download official digital transcripts or you can convert your transcripts and documents to PDF files, so the choice is yours. Um, information on how to convert documents to PDF files is available on our website. So for example, you can scan or take a picture of your official transcript and then save them as PDF files, that's an option. And again, do please ensure that you upload all of the required documents and documentation to minimize any delays in your application processing. So um, regarding the application or the admissions process rather, um, BCIT's admissions department will review all applications to ensure the academic entrance requirements have been met. Admissions will then forward the applications to the medical radiography program area for review. After the application deadline date, the program area will then shortlist and select the applicants. Admissions um, will then send out acceptance letters or non-accept le non letters. And applicants will then be notified if you're accepted to pay the commitment fee. And again, the commitment fee for domestic applicants is $500. So there are some laddering opportunities upon completion of the med medical radiography diploma. So um, you could potentially go on to um, the medic magnetic resonance imaging advanced certificate or the Bachelor of Health Sciences with the M MRI option. Those are BCIT laddering opportunities. You could also potentially go on and do the Bachelor of Health Science at TRU, Thompson Rivers University. Again, at BCIT, there's also the Health Leadership Advanced Certificate. That's another potential option. And lastly, the Bachelor of Technology um, in Technology Management at BCIT, which is a part-time studies degree. So there's um, a lot of support um, that when you're at BCIT for your success here. So some of the important service areas I'd like to mention, um, BCIT is continually committed to providing assistance to students with permanent or temporary disabilities. If you have been accepted to a program and believe you may need an accommodation to be successful, I definitely encourage you to connect with our Accessibility Services Department. We do have an amazing Counseling and Student Development Department who are available to help enhance your educational performance and maximize your success as a student at BCIT. They have been offering virtual and phone appointments presently, and you can refer to their webpage directly from BCIT's website. If you're an Indigenous um, applicant, BCIT's Indigenous Initiatives Department is here for you to help ensure a smooth transition into your first year. 
They offer peer-to-peer -peer mentorship, a welcoming gathering place, and they provide clarification on Indigenous funding options. At the BCIT Burnaby campus, we have a BCIT Student Health Services, and they provide medical care for BCIT students year-round, and they're staffed by a uh, full staff of doctors and nurses. I also do encourage you to review BCIT's awards, scholarship, and bursaries that are listed on our financial aid and awards webpage. Um, there's also one, one award, the President's uh, Entrance Award, for which selection is based on academic achievement, but also on volunteer and community service. So you can, again, look into that more on BCIT's financial aid uh, website or webpage, rather. And lastly, the Recreation Services Department, where all kinds of activities from basketball to yoga to wall climbing, there's a bunch of different cool activities there in classes to help you balance your body and mind during your studies. So you can connect with us. If you have any questions after today's session, feel free to connect with us in program advising. We do have services available via telephone, email, and both in-person and Zoom. Uh, Drop-in visits are available as well. And you can go to our webpage, www.bcit.ca forward slash advising for our updated contact information and our current service hours. And I would like to mention, though, if your inquiry is time sensitive, definitely the quickest way to get in touch with us is by phone during our telephone hours. So I'll now uh, throw it back to Darren to take over. Thanks, Darren. Thank you so much, Maggie. That was excellent. So I just want to let everyone uh, notice, uh, know that uh, we would love for you to connect with us on uh, social media, uh, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, or LinkedIn. And um, it's also, if you go to the BCIT website, there's lots of other information you can get. Uh, hopefully we're back into doing tours and uh, the spend a days, hopefully in the near future. Uh, big infos are always great. And of course, these info sessions that you're attending right now, we have them all week if there's others you may be interested in. And of course, advising has just a lots of information. And I know we're just about out of time for questions and answers, but I know while Maggie was talking, uh, <laughs> Denise and Julie were working away on the uh, chat. <laughs> and I'm not sure if there's anything outstanding that we want to cover in the next couple minutes before we sign off. Hi, I do have a question that was sent directly to me. Um, and it was, if we meet all those academic requirements and apply, how long will it take before candidates are notified acceptance or not? For those who aren't accepted, what will happen? Very good question. <laughs> So I think I answered a little bit of that for somebody else's question. Usually we wait till the application window closes before we send out um, acceptance or you know, provisional acceptance notifications. Um, then um, I'm not sure usually what happens after that uh, regarding students that are not accepted. I'm, I'm not sure, Maggie, if, if there's a letter or notification that goes out to those students. Yeah, from my understanding, admissions will definitely send non-accept um, information via through my communication through my BCIT to anyone who unfortunately is non offered a non a, not accept to the program, so that they will be notified. Yes. Um, actually, is it okay? Uh, uh, Gideon had a really interesting question at the beginning, um, and I made a note of it. Is it okay to ask it now? Is, is that all right? Please do. Do I have a second? I thought this was really interesting. He, um, Gideon mentioned, with technology advancing to, um, nowadays and age, are the are medical radiographers replaceable with AI in the near future? So again, another good question. Um, so we have been watching the advent of the AI uh, experience coming in. Um, you know, to some degree, there there could be some replacement. But when it comes to dealing with patients that are unable to respond to instructions or directions, um, I don't think that's something that can be replaced by AI. Um, it, there's a lot of the AI uh, coming into the radiologist's realm where um, reporting the cases and the images. Um, so, so they're starting to use a lot more AI for consistency they're finding that they're really picking up on pathologies and, and consistently. So we're seeing a change there in the radiologist end of things, but for ourselves, not quite yet. And in the future, I don't think it will ever completely be replaced. Thank you, Denise. 
Um, there was one more from Emma that was near the beginning, which um, I thought was a good question. Emma asks, which hospitals have clinical site placements for students? I don't know, um, Denise, if you're able to um, share that information with, with the group. I can, and I can ramble off the list. <laughs> uh, so the bigger, larger trauma centers, we have VGH, RCH, Surrey Memorial, and Abbotsford uh, in the Lower Mainland. And then a lot of the smaller hospitals, um, and I'm going to come back um, from the valley back out to the coast. Um, we have Langley. Uh, we have, goodness, now, now I'm going to say that my geography is not good. So, uh, but Burnaby Hospital, um, I'm just trying to remember all the smaller hospitals. Uh, there's Lionsgate, there's Richmond. So, so usually we have 12 within the lower mainland. And then the ones in the interior include uh, Royal Inland, uh, Kelowna General, and then Penticton and Vernon and Cranbrook and Trail. Wow. Yeah, so wow. we do have a wide variety of hospitals. And like I said, we tend to try and have students attend both groupings so that you actually get the trauma experience and the large center experience and then a smaller community hospital as well. Actually, speaking of the trauma, sorry, one more question that I noted that I thought was really good, again, near the beginning, asked by Alexandra. Alexandra asked, do you deal with a lot of blood and trauma in radiography? Um, very passionate about anatomy and physiology, but do have a mild phobia of blood. Is it possible to be successful in this field without dealing with a lot of gore on a daily basis? I'm going to say, unfortunately not. It doesn't happen daily, um, you know, but we are expected to, you know, go to the OR and go into the trauma room and depending on the situations, they could be messy or they could be clean. Like even surgeries, um, you know, they cauterize as they go. So there's not a lot of blood, but then, you know, in other situations, if it's a trauma, say a trauma that has now moved up to the OR, that's usually messy. Yeah, so, um, I'm, you know, if you can get through the program and, and prove competence in those areas, um, there's many graduates that choose to then work in a clinical setting in the clinics um, because they're, you know, they don't have a trauma center there like, and they don't, don't go to the OR. So yeah, I'm going to say there's way less body fluid there, but you would actually have to prove competence, competence um, across all of those areas prior to getting to that point, unfortunately. Thank you, Denise. I'm going to combine two uh, last minute questions here, see if I can do this. Uh, do we have to pay for the practicum or is the practicum paid? Do you get paid to do the practicum? Mm, uh, unfortunately, they no longer pay for the practicums. And yes, you do have to pay uh, for the practicum term. Um, the practicum, the, the cost of tuition for those terms also covers your liability insurance. Um, and uh, so there are still costs, even though they're not on at, at the campus, there's still costs that, um, other costs that are there that are incurred that have to be paid. Thanks, Denise. How about, um, uh, for volunteer work, uh, with the volunteer work after conditional acceptance, would you provide a place where we could do this or do we have to find one ourselves? Um, applicants would have to find them themselves. Yeah, we don't, we, we don't even really provide a list. We provide um, some guidance towards the type of volunteer experiences that we're looking for. And usually they are in senior centers, retirement homes, um, like wayfinding in a hospital, even though you're in the hospital, you, you know, and you might be directing people in certain areas, you're not really interacting for longer periods of time with patients or clients. And that's what we're looking for. Um, the experience is so that when you come into the program, that you have an expectation of, you know, the experiences that you're going to have and that it's not a surprise, like the body fluids, the smells, um, you know, th those type of things. And so that's what the experience, the volunteer experience is supposed to give you. It's not just about giving your time. Thank you, Denise. Um, Erica, oh, can I ask sorry. one more super quick question? I'm so sorry, Denise, if that's okay. Sure. No, sorry, sorry. Sorry. Speaking, I guess this AI thing is a popular topic now. Um, so Carl asks, will AI content potentially be added to this program in the future? And if so, after you, if those have graduated after the AI stuff's been added, will they have to 
um, complete some sort of upgrading to be current in the new technology and theory? Like, what do you, what do you think? So once you graduate and you start working, say, at a hospital or a site, and as new technology comes into place and is replaced in the hospital, then usually the training happens on site. We do, um, and the professional body, the CMRT, also provides courses and upgradings um, for graduates and technologists. Like for instance, CT is entry to practice for us. So the program itself has two CT courses and we put you out in a, in a six to eight week um, clinical experience. But there's also a CT certificate that can be achieved um, by going to the professional um, association, the CMRT. So there's a lot, for us it's lifelong long learning um, if you're, you know, specific to AI, I would say the same thing is that as that were to be introduced into the clinical areas, those, those sites would then upgrade their technologists, um, at the site on that specific piece of equipment, but there would probably be more courses, um, and more, um, say workshops that could be achieved through the, the, prof the professional body. Thank you. That's great. So we are just a little over time, but if you have, uh, if you maybe think of something later, uh, you can certainly contact uh, medical radiography at the email on the screen. If you have program specific questions, or if you have more admissions advising questions, you can uh, contact program underscore advising at bcit.ca. And I do have, just a, sorry, sorry Aaron, one yeah. more comment I meant to mention it before. I did put it in the chat. Sorry. Um, if you are interested in a little bit more information about the profession, um, there is, um, it's called Medical Radiography Explorations, and it's, um, it's a free course through BCIT, so you just um, search bcit.ca, and then search MOOC, M-O-O-C, 0350, and it's um, a free course, and it, 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 there's testimonials in there, talks about the, the different areas in the, in the profession itself, so I just wanted to mention that. I did put it in the chat further up, but I think it kind of <laughs> got lost up there. Oh, that's a good one. Thank you, Denise. Thanks. So yeah, um, that's it for today, but I'll remind you that a copy of the slide presentation along with the uh, links to the YouTube video of this session uh, will be mailed out later next week, I'd say. And um, I just wanna say thank you for all of you being with us today and we wish you the very best in your future in health sciences. Thank you so well, thank much. Thank you so much. Bye. Have a great night. Thank you. Bye.